So please give a warm welcome to Peter and Jade Reed. It's very bright. <laughs> what a lovely intro. Um, how many entrepreneurs in the room? Oh my God. <laughs> a lot. How many aspiring entrepreneurs in the room? Come on, <laughs> you want to. <laughs> okay, so this is for all of you. Um, so our passion is to uh, embolden more young people to take a more entrepreneurial path through life and to help equip them with the requisite skills, specifically resilience. So uh, entrepreneurs are special. Uh, they, uh, well, as many of you know, they set out you know, every day to reshape the universe. And uh, they do stuff that, on a daily basis, that has an 80% chance of failure. But when they succeed, they create you know, innovative, disruptive new products and services. They um, you know, create meaningful jobs. They drive economic gro growth. There's a lot to love. Um, and by the way, just a, a, a misperception to clear up at the beginning, you know, it's often, you know, oh, it's all about the idea. It's rarely about just the idea. It's always about execution and getting stuff done. So whilst Dad loves to talk about this stuff, and he does a lot, believe me, uh, I actually do it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I help run a seed investment fund uh, in London uh, where we help the brightest and best young entrepreneurs from around Europe uh, create startups from scratch over a six-month period. So it sounds slightly counterintuitive, um, especially if you have been entrepreneurs yourselves. So I'm going to explain it in a little bit more detail. Um, so basically, we select people as people uh, before they have a team and before they have an idea. But they are the best uh, technologists from where they come from. So often they have done PhDs or maybe they are in postdoctoral research or they've been working in their companies for uh, you know, four or five years and they've been at Google, Facebook, DeepMind, whatever. Um, in fields such as robotics or computer vision or machine learning or any of these big sort of technical buzzwords that you hear a lot these days. Um, so we select them because they are amazing and they are experts in their field, but before they have a team and before they have an idea. We bring them to London and then we help them uh, form a company and build a company with a team uh, over a six month period. So, so far, we have built 50 companies in uh, just over three years, and they're now collectively valued at about $400 million. So, we're on our way to something. Um, All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, yeah, so, so as part of that, clearly, I think about how to um, uh, not only support those people to build brilliant companies that create value in the world, but also uh, how to make sure they uh, are okay and do this in a sustainable way and are compassionate and wise and all the things that we uh, are here to talk about. So, um, so there you are. She actually really does do it. Um, and um, again, actually, if I can sort of step back a little bit and be the, the you know, think about it philosophically, it might be helpful to uh, understand what, what entrepreneurs actually do. Um, and they take risks, uh, by definition. And specifically, um, it's helpful probably to think about it in, in three steps. So first of all, identifying and quantifying a set of risks that are worth taking. That might be market risk, it might be product risk, it might be execution risk. Um, but once, having identified those risks worth taking, it, the second step is about managing those risks, which actually is really about um, building a team, building competitive differentiation. As soon as you've had an idea and you've started to launch it, a hundred competitors are going to go and do the same thing. So how do you, you know, stay ahead? And then the third piece, the third step, probably for another conference, is hopefully, eventually, uh, generating an economic, a commensurate economic return on having taken that risk in the first place. Uh, but uh, returning to the, the first one, identifying and quantifying risks worth taking. Yeah, so... In sort of practical terms, what that means at the very beginning for an entrepreneur, um, identifying risks is basically figuring out what you should work on. Um, so I think it's really important to bear in mind that the median outcome of starting a startup is, is failure, is zero. Most of them don't go anywhere. Most of them don't really achieve what they set out to achieve. Um, 
And that means that identifying this initial risk is a really, really, really important thing to do. The opportunity cost of starting the wrong thing is extraordinarily high. Uh, so this first step of identifying risk is one of, is one of the most important. Um, and how we do that in practice on the program is we get the entrepreneurs to ask themselves, um, why you, why now? So um, each person has a very specific background. Uh, and that means that each person really uh, uh, should or could only create a very small number of startups. So, you know, what skills or expertise do you have, which means that you uniquely are qualified to build uh, this company? So, a lot of people <laughs> come onto the program and they, they're like a roboticist and they've built an autonomously flying, uh, no, so, sorry, a UOV that like perpetually flies or something like that. And they get on the program and they think, like, oh yeah, startups why don't I build a food delivery business or something? <laughs> just because you, you just associate it with these like startup ideas. But the first thing we help the, um, the entrepreneurs to understand is that they have these unique skills and this unique experience, which means they are uniquely qualified to build some kind of company. So that's the first bit. And then there's the why now bit. So it's, you know, what has changed in the market? What has just become possible? What technology has just uh, been created, which means that this product can only now exist? Uh, and so if you package that up, um, you can actually turn it into quite a nice optimization problem. So there are loads of paths, all of which bear a lot of risk. Uh, but your job as an entrepreneur, in the first case, is to choose the path of uh, most, um, uh, most suitable risk, if you will. So that is, that is stage number one. So, and, and just pausing there for a second and reflecting on that. So these are uh, people who are deliberately inviting risk into their lives, right? And that's a, um, for most of us who I'd warrant spend most of our time trying to minimize or even totally negate risk in our lives, that seems like a sort of fairly crazy thing to do. Um, Barbara Sahakian, who's a, a professor um, of psychiatry at Cambridge University, she did a very um, interesting piece of analysis on uh, what she calls hot decision-making. So these are decisions that have a, a high emotional content. Uh, and it turns out that in a statistically significant, measurable way, entrepreneurs are much better at making those decisions than the rest of us. So it is actually sort of measurable. Um, and, you know, again, bear in mind that inviting risk into one's life isn't just business risk, it isn't professional risk, it always translates to personal risk too. So it is risk to your health, risk to your relationships, risk to your mortgage, whatever, whatever it is. Think about it, I mean, reflect on that for a second, it's kind of a crazy thing to do. So the second bit is, um, you know, having identified the risk and quantified it, so how do we then manage it and build a team and competitive advantage. Yeah. So then once the entrepreneur has invited this risk into their, all aspects of their lives uh, and they realize what company they want to build, uh, then they have the really, really hard bit of actually creating something valuable. So, I mean, I think the Klarna guys and maybe Spotify guys are in the audience at the moment and um, all of you that put your um, hands up at the beginning will know how hard this bit is. You know, having a good idea is part of the way, but really just is 1%, uh, we like to say it's 1% it in, in inspiration, 99% perspiration, right? So you've got this good idea, but then the really, really hard work starts. And uh, people say it's, it's all about execution. And um, in lots of business settings, uh, execution is a kind of simple, somewhat simple task of getting stuff done. But as an entrepreneur, it's getting stuff done in the face of constant adversity. And that's the really, really, really hard part. And on the program, uh, one of our, the things that I'm most sad about is the, the biggest cause of failure is that the founders give up because it's really hard. It's so difficult. There are so many more easier ways to make money um, in the world than there are to, to try, and, try and be an entrepreneur, um, especially at that super early stage where it's just you or you and one other person. Um, so, we see, so we see a lot of people give up. And so up to this point, you've probably been thinking, is this just a lecture on how to start a company? But this is where the resilience part comes in. So this is where resilience is really, really important and, and makes a difference between uh, an entrepreneur who burns out and maybe gives up and an entrepreneur who uh, continues and creates something truly valuable and you know, creates the Spotify's and the Klanas that are still alive today. 
So um, let's think about that for a second. So what is resilience and how do we build it? Um, and when we talk about resilience, we like to think about it in, in sort of two ways, two buckets, if you like. One is about uh, protecting the downside of being an entrepreneur, and one is about unlocking, uh, unlocking the upside. So in terms of protecting the downside, what we really mean by resilience in this entrepreneurial setting is, uh, you know, mental well-being in the face of, you know, adversity. Uh, it's about uh, managing stress and anxiety. It's about making decisions in highly ambiguous, highly uncertain, highly volatile environments. Uh, it's very often about, um, uh, it, it, it's very about, it, it, it's very often about emotional intelligence as well. That often translates through to performance at a, at a sort of a company startup level. Um, so that's the protecting the downside. That's what we mean by resilience there. Um, and let me stop there and just ask for my next bit, who um, can tell me the opposite of fragile? Any, um, any words? The opposite of fragile. Robust. Adaptive. Robust again. Durable. Solid, durable. Oh, Hello. You Who's the read that book? You've been cheating. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, um, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely true. So, the, you know, fragile is clearly stuff that collapses when it confronts risk, uncertainty, volatility. And robust, durable, that's what I would have said. All that really means is it can withstand um, risk, volatility, un volatility, uncertainty. And Nassim uh, Nicholas Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan, also wrote another book called Anti-Fragile, uh, because the word didn't exist, so he invented one. And, and what he means by that, and I think it's a really fascinating concept, and, um, and he actually often talks about you know, entrepreneurs are anti-fragile. And the notion here is that you know, these are people who positively bloom and blossom with more risk, uncertainty, volatility around them. They see that risk, uncertainty, volatility as information rich. This is information about your customers, about the marketplace, about regulation, about whatever it might be, what are your competitors. And, you know, the rest of us who are busy minimizing risk in our lives are closing out all that information. Whereas entrepreneurs bringing risk into their lives are opening themselves up to all that information richness, which is, I think, an incredibly powerful concept. <laughs> I'm glad at least one other person's read the book. Um, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and, and then there's a sort of a more pragmatic question around, all right, so this resilience thing is great. It protects the downside. It unlocks the upside or it helps. Um, how do we build it? Sounds marvelous. So um, uh, a few ideas on that. One is around uh, Christine Podesky, um, who's done some really, really interesting work on what she calls strength-based CBT. And it's where the, uh, the therapist will work with a client, identify uh, her or his strengths in, in terms of resilience, and then build a personal model for resilience. So it's CBT applied specifically to um, cognitive behavioral therapy, applied specifically to this area. Um, a corollary of that is, is mindfulness. Um, and um, this is where... Uh, you know, we've, we've been uh, privy to some really, really interesting experiments. So I'm on the board of the Oxford Mindfulness Center with Mark Williams and Willem Kuyk and, and an incredibly talented team. Um, and we actually very early on got Mark Williams to come into Entrepreneur First and do guided mindfulness sessions for the entrepreneurs, um, which you can, I mean, it was an incredibly exciting, rich experience. We also got Felicia Huppert from uh, Cambridge Wellbeing at Cambridge University to come and do the same thing. Absolutely amazing. And it's, um, you know, that's a very, you can just sort of see it. It's palpable. You can feel it. Um, the third area is actually something uh, we've, um, we've often talked about with uh, Ruby Wax, whom you saw yesterday, um, which is around... Uh, you know, a, a next generation of technology which actually kind of exists. And if you want to think about it as, uh, you know, Fitbit for the mind. So technology, in, in the way that technology has helped us understand and develop an objective understanding of our physical well-being, Fitbit, jawbone, all these things that count how many steps we take. Imagine, and it now exists, technology, and actually it, most of it's going to sit in the ear, which is an interesting thing. We could talk about that. Um, the sensors in the ear are very well placed to pick up heart rate variability, good proxy for cortisol and stress. Uh, and they're very, very accurate readings. And therefore, you'd have some technology that sort of tells you, 
through some kind of readout, whether you're in a fragile state or an anti-fragile state at that moment in time. And you may then choose not to have certain conversations with your customers or your partner or um, your co-founders or whatever it is at that moment in time. I'll come back in an hour and we can carry on with that conversation. Um, we can talk more about that later. Um, so I think that gives you a taste of uh, how many different ways there are to build up resilience. Uh, and I think one of the most important things that we believe is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all model, and it often can't be prescriptive for a whole group. Um, there's so many ways that you can build up your resilience. There's so many ways that you can be less stressed and more creative and more focused, whatever. There's, uh, and it really has to come from something internal. So on the program, we don't uh, have a you know resilience course or whatever, um, because I think often that uh, you can't quite fit what everyone needs with, a, with, with one solution. Um, but what we do really believe in and what we really encourage um, is the culture of having a growth mindset. So I don't know if anyone here has read um, uh, the book by Carol Dweck or seen the TED Talk. It's 10 minutes. If you haven't watched it, you should watch it. Um, so she's, she's written a book on um, the growth mindset. And basically, uh, there are two types of mindset, um, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So in a fixed mindset, um, uh, if you have a fixed mindset, you are born and you grow up and you realize that you are really great at basketball and like very bad at maths and an all right listener and not bad at cello. And you don't really think that anything you can do, there's anything you can do to really change that, right? You're as smart as you'll ever be and there's some things you're good at, there's some things you're not good at and that's your lot. But uh, there's this other mindset called a growth mindset. Um, and if you have a growth mindset, then you believe that uh, even your most basic abilities can be changed by dedication and hard work. So in a great, great growth mindset, you might think, you know, at school you weren't very good at maths, um, and you weren't really very good at basketball either, um, but you are, you know, an amazing cellist, whatever it might be. But the important thing there is that all of those things are just um, in the present and don't reflect what can happen in the future. Um, and so we really, really want to um, embrace this culture of learning and improving uh, and uh, showing people that you can learn and improve in whatever way suits you best. So we try and have this big culture of a, group mi uh, of a growth mindset, you know, where you are not just born resilient or not, and you're not just born a good entrepreneur or not, um, but we try and help give people the tools to uh, improve themselves. Uh, and that's kind of the culture that we want to create. So I was just thinking, actually, we're back with, um, with Ruby. We're back with Gloria Gaynor. Um, and she's <laughs> going to have to rewrite, <laughs> I am what I am. And we're going to have to think of something that rhymes with neuroplasticity, right? <laughs> Which is quite <laughs> tricky. So that's what we, um, that's all we really sort of had to say. But we would love to take questions if we have time. Um, so we're, we would love questions. Does anybody have any questions? And you'll let us know if we don't have time. Okay. Yeah. So we don't. So we offer it. Um, we say, hey, there's this talk happening. Would you like to come? And if they come, that's brilliant. And we give them the tools to then go away and do it themselves or go on a course or use Headspace, whatever it might be, whatever suits them. Um, but we never say, I don't want it to be looked upon as a tool for making you a better entrepreneur. I think it's really important that it's looked upon as a, you know, a way of life and a way of being that's much more holistic than just... Uh, that very sort of, sort of narrow transactional thing that it can be. So, and, and another um, thing that we've found is that uh, when mindfulness comes wrapped in a neuroscience wrapper, it tends to resonate with uh, the younger entrepreneurs that you know, Jade's working with all day, every day. Um, and so the, the more it is about your amygdala shrinking and your hippocampus enlarging, that tends to resonate with um, you know, those, kind of, yeah. those kind of brains, young plastic brains. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, behind you. So, so entrepreneurs are very energy-driven, right? Mm. Um, um, so what happens when an entrepreneur has often worked a bit too much and, and burns a bit too quickly or, you know, that sort of... Are you trying to limit that? Or, or no, not at all. I think basically it's like 
Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question, right? Because it, yeah, 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 the, yeah. the type A personality. Exactly. There are certain types of people who succeed um, as an entrepreneur and building companies, um, and I think they are often uh, the kind of we we can all imagine the kind of personality types associated with that. And one of those is working really, really hard um, and loving that, and they love the challenge. Um, but I don't think it's about changing the way people are. I think it's about saying, look, if you would like uh, some uh, assistance with this. If you would like to know more, then we will tell you it. It's not meant to be a, you know, a push on don't work or do things a separate way. It's meant to be, if you feel like this could help, then yeah. Pull, pull, tends, pull tends to work better than, than push. Mm. Um, and those sort of, you know, the, the, the burnout kind of energy uh, that you're talking about, um, I think, you know, a lot of what we've found, and actually we've, we've taken a lot of inspiration in this from um, friends like Anthony Selden, who's talked to at these events before, who's a headmaster at one of the big schools in, in the UK, and works with 14 to 16-year-olds on uh, you know, mental well-being. And part of the mental well-being is physical well-being. So um, you know, actually uh, doing games and you know, leading a you know, vaguely healthy lifestyle is, very, you know, is, a, is a tight corollary to you know, mental well-being as well. Mm. Um, yeah, behind. The lady just behind. Oh, no. No, Wasn't can't see. Oh, no, I, I thought there was a hand on. Oh. <laughs> Somebody's scratching their you head. You one. just bought the auction item. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That. Yeah, so I, I mean, that is such an interest. I mean, mm. that's probably a longer conversation, but, but I'll have a go at it right now because the answer is yes, right? So we are, um, we're being sort of narrow and narrow-minded in, in doing what we've just described. Um, we're also just trying to be a pull rather than push. Um, but I think the, you know, the, the point is really well made. And what we've often found, and I know, um, uh, by the way, I, I left Google a couple of months ago. I know I was introduced as working at Google Ventures, but <laughs> I left a couple of months ago. It's an amazing company. One of the things that um, uh, Google, that Meng and you know, others um, you know, found that they had to do in the early days of um, getting these kind of programs, Google Pause and Search Inside Yourself moving within a, within a corporate um, uh, edifice like that was actually to tie it to... Uh, in that case, emotional intelligence and you know all the great stuff that Dan, Daniel Goleman has done, uh, and because emotional intelligence had already previously been tied to you know improvements in performance and productivity and therefore profitability, and therefore that within a corporate setting made it more palatable, it made it more fundable by you know these things cost money, um, and therefore again I think maybe there's something in a crowd like this that we'd look at that and go well. Is that really about the individual, which is probably where we would feel it should be, or is that really about you know, helping the company be more profitable? So again, I think some of these approaches inevitably end up being a little bit more narrow-minded and more focused in order to get done. Um, and does that help answer it? I mean, you know, it's, it's an entirely fair point that we're sort of taking it down and, and narrowing. But in a, in a way, that's deliberate because it's, it's more likely, therefore, to have momentum and, you know, and actually, actually happen. Applying a bit of entrepreneurial logic to our own thinking, <laughs> in a way. Any others? Yeah. Hi. You have to after six months. <laughs> uh, so it ends in a demo day, which is where we get uh, 200 of Europe's top investors all together in a room. Uh, the companies present what they I wasn't invited last time, by the way. You were. <laughs> he was at Burning Man. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, so they, they present to this room full of investors, which kickstarts the normal investment process. So I think the average amount of money raised for a company that's been through the program on demo day is £600,000. And um, so it tends to end in funding which so, means they can survive. And if I can just reflect on that, so I was invited to the previous one, and I sat next to um, a friend of mine who's regarded as the dean of sort of seed early stage investing in Europe, and he sat next to me, and he leant over, and the, um, what Jade said about this sort of the picking individuals with raw technology and science talent, that really works. That's very different from anything else you see you know, anywhere. 
And as a result, when you're sitting there and you've got some guys who have developed some machine computer vision technology to uh, investigate the welds in Trans-Siberian gas and oil pipelines. Um, and it turns out that machine <laughs> vision does that a whole lot better than drunk Siberians. Um, so it's sort of, this is empowerful. How did they come up with this? I mean, this is an incredible idea. And you just get these, um, and then in the last one was, these guys have invented a, I mean, in smart factories, so, uh, and they've invented a robotic arm. And the technology to create the robotic arm was only made available two months into the six months period that they were there. And because they were the two people who knew most about this piece of hardware, um, you know, they came up with it, it was in their stride, and they knew about it and incorporated it mm. in the business plan. As a result, this guy sitting next to me leant over and said, this is hands down the best demo day I've ever been to. It was sort of a, you know, that's quite a testament. And he, yeah, I think it's public, he invested in the fund the next day. So. <laughs> so. Yeah, sorry. Hi, Hans. <laughs> Anybody brave enough to confess? <laughs> 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 Yeah, so I, uh, I can, I can have a go at that. Yeah, go uh, first, first point is that all you entrepreneurs in the room, here's the guy with the checkbook. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> Just identified himself. Um, the, um, the second observation is, part of, I think part of the reason we um, start with <clears throat> entrepreneurial startup companies is because by their very nature, if they're the minority that you know, grow and are successful, they are taking, you know, the DNA gets writ, writ large fairly rapidly, and therefore, you know, at the beginning when Jade's seeing them, it's one, two individuals. By the time I'm seeing them, there are a few more, and by the time Hans sees them, there are probably 100 people there. They basically, by sowing those seeds at that very early stage, it sort of, it's, um, it augments and multiplies sort of naturally and organically. Um, so that's why I think a lot of part of it is because that's the lens through which we see the world, the entrepreneurial lens. Um, but that's why we feel good about doing that. In terms of sort of big companies, um, I've actually uh, done, um, yeah, I've been approached by a couple of the big um, banks who probably should go, you know, nameless, who have seen some of this and, um, uh, you know, are probably witnessing uh, the energy burnout that um, the guy in the middle was talking about more than more than most, and are starting to you know starting to uh, explore it. And um, and actually, Ruby was with us. We launched something called the Mindfulness Initiative in Parliament. It's an all part all party parliamentary group initiative in in the British Parliament. Um, and one strand of that is mindfulness in the workplace. And it was really interesting that you know representation in that isn't just the little companies, it's um, you know, some of the big ones as well. Uh, and also big organizations like the National Health Service and the criminal justice system. So larger organizations, probably small tip of the iceberg, but they do seem to be showing an interest. I um, hope that answers it a little bit. I'm sorry, but I've been appointed oh. the gatekeeper okay. for some reason. <laughs> I always have to come out and say time has <laughs> run right. out, and it's, it's not one of my favorite things to do. But, um, I mean, we, I would love to continue this uh, conversation. And also to answer your question, I co-hosted the Nordic Business Forum in Helsinki just the other week, and 5,500 people in the audience, and Ariana Huffington, Simon Sinek, Nilofer Merchant, and so forth, and they were all talking about endorsing leadership, compassionate leadership or wisdom, both on an entrepreneurial level, but also on a corporate level. So I think it's out there. It's just that it needs to echo even further. Mm. Please do catch these two in the break, which we'll be having soon. And I keep on asking, thank you so much. I have 
Like mm -hmm. I said, a lot of questions, but we don't have time. <laughs> but um, thank you for those insights. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>